I know a great deal about death. As a young missionary, I lived for many years in a country that was torn apart by war. In that time, 23,000 people died. Sometimes to get the mail, I would have to walk over a dead body. The beauty of man is destroyed by death. The hope of all men, destroyed by death. In my family, it has been torn apart by death. My brother was killed when he was six years old. My father died in my arms in the middle of a field. And a few years ago, I preached the funeral of my sister. I know much about death, but death is too strong of an enemy to overcome. No matter how much you wrestle him, no matter how much you fight against him, no matter how much you live in self-denial, that he is not going to knock on your door. Know this, that he is coming for you. And there is nothing you can do about it. As David said, there is but a few steps between me and death. Within just a few years, some of you will be dead. Within 25 years, many more of you will be dead. And with a hundred years, not only all of us will be dead, but we will be forgotten. All our hopes will be crushed. Every memory of whatever we have done will be erased. And of all creatures, we are most pitiful. Because not only is death coming for us, we know it. You know it. And you know it. You do everything in your power to push it out of your thoughts. But he's coming for you. Maybe even this evening. He's coming for your children. And there's nothing you can do. But there is one who has faced death head on. There is one, a mighty warrior, who went into death stronghold and defeated him in his strongest place. There is one who has overcome man's greatest enemy. His name is Jesus Christ. And he bore the sins of the world. And he died upon a tree. And he paid for the very thing that is the cause of our death. And on the third day, the Father raised him from the dead. And on the third day, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And on the third day, he raised himself from the dead. And now the smallest, weakest believer can look death right in the face and say, Oh, death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? Sin, where is your power? You who have devoured nations, you will devour no more. You see, the gospel is good news, great news. God is crying out to you about it. Did not Paul the Apostle himself say, I am pleading with you, but it is though God is pleading with you through me. Why will you live a life that has no meaning? Why will you live a life that literally is going to fall apart? Why will you allow yourself to be swallowed up by death? Why don't you come to Christ? What is holding you? What is this thing that has control of your mind and your heart? Come to Christ. You say, oh, it's too good to be true. It is true. You say, oh, I'm too great a sinner. You are not greater than the Christ, are you? You do not have more power than His grace, do you? Come to Him. He's captivated the world because he was such a unique individual, really larger than life it seemed. And yet now he's really no different than these I passed by in the cemetery. That's a sobering thought. The tendency is when people die is they, they, they turn to their emotions and their affections for an individual and truth gets obscured. Objective truth gets lost in the midst of it. And people tend to believe what they want to believe. But what's true about the Michael Jackson? Where is he now? We read these tombstones here, asleep in Jesus, uh, sweet Jesus, resting in Jesus. How many really are resting in Jesus? We can't trust our emotions. Our emotions go up and down. They come and go. So we can't trust them. They won't take us to what's true. They won't lead us to truth. They certainly won't change what's true. But yet, unfortunately, as people dwell upon thoughts of their, their lost loved ones and their, rehash their memories. What so often happens is they're led to embrace fault, falsehood, things that aren't true. I mean, things are said even in funerals that aren't true. How many, how many funerals have you been to where 
A preacher says, well, I'm sorry, uh, we have no confidence that Mr. So-and-so or, or Mrs. So-and-so is, is with the Lord because their life, the life they live was completely contrary to the life of, of a true Christian. <laughs> You've never heard that. I, I've never heard that. Why? Because everybody somehow ends up in heaven in a funeral, even the worst of sinners. People want to think what's... People want to think the best. But what's true? That's all that really matters. Not what you and I think. Not what the person in the grave, what they thought. But what's really true? Where are they at? How do we establish that? Is that left to, to man and women? Men and women? Are they the determining factor of what's, what happens beyond the grave? Or is it our Creator? What does His Word say? Our Word means nothing. We need to consult God. God's left us His Word. This is, the, this is the revelation of what's true concerning life and death, concerning what lies beyond the grave. In the passing of Michael Jackson, some very important realities have come to us. God has taught us and confirmed to us some very important spiritual truths. I have ten reasons why Michael Jackson's life and death matter. The first one is it teaches us the dangerous power of idolatry. In 1 John 5.21, we're told, keep yourselves from idols. We're told so because idolatry is sin and it's very destructive. It's often associated with demonic power. In Colossians 3.5, it says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry is anything we put in the place of God. Anything that's elevated our heart with affection over Jesus Christ, over and above Jesus Christ. That's idolatry. Michael Jackson's life was all about idolatry. He worshipped music. He worshipped dance. He worshipped himself and his own image. And there's nothing to be found of Jesus Christ in his life. The third reason why Michael Jackson's life and death matter is it teaches us that enormous wealth is poisonous to flesh. 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10 says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Money is often a major snare. Why? Because money is equal to power, and power is what men really thirst for. They want to be on top. They want to be the top dog. They want to be God. They want to be king. Michael, he regarded himself as king, and he lived as one. And you know what? Michael Jackson had his reward. He's no longer king now. He's gone from king to a prisoner of darkness. Just like that. In a moment, he wasn't expecting it. The fifth reason why Michael Jackson's life and death matter is it was an example of a wasted life. What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world, Jesus said, and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is a, what is a person willing to trade their eternal, never-dying soul for? Many people just foolish things, things that don't last, things they can't take to eternity with them. We all have 24 hours a day, as many, as many days God gives us. What are we doing with them? What's our soul invested in? What are we doing with the time, the time and the talent and the treasures that God, God has given unto us? We're stewards. We're responsible. We're accountable to God. 1 Timothy 6, 7 says, For we, bought, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. For Michael Jackson, he's been stripped of it all. It's all gone. Every one of his accomplishments, all that he did, Neverland, ironically, never gave him what he wanted. It didn't. All his platinum records, all his money, all his mansions and accomplishments, they're, 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 they're left to rust and corrupt. They're still here. He's not. He's gone. There's nothing in the spirit will, world that does nothing in this world that does him any good in the spirit world. The world now where he's accountable to God and he faces his judgment. Jackson lived for his own glory and not for the glory of Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is a wasted life. Yet mankind never seeks to defy that truth. The seventh reason why Michael Jackson's life and death matter is it's a great reminder that's been given unto man once to die and then the judgment. You know, there's only really two certainties about life. It's death and it's judgment. Those two things are certain. 
God's judgment, my friend, is far different than man's judgment. God's not impressed with Michael Jackson's moonwalk. He's not, he's not impressed with the success that he had in this life. Not at all. His judgment scale is far different. When Michael Jackson stands before God, God requires an absolute perfect righteousness. No man alive has that. Not one. Michael Jackson's in the same dilemma you and I are in. We have no good to offer God. In fact, before him we're a putrefying rag. We're a sinner deserving of eternal damnation. No, don't, don't get the idea, as so many people do, this false idea that there's a scale in heaven and God's going to put our good deeds on one side and our bad deeds on the other. That is not true. You place one bad thing on that scale, it'll cost you all eternity. It will. What you need, you need a substitute. You need a Savior. One that's fully perfect. Perfectly good. One that has taken all your bad upon Him and in turn put all His good upon you. That's salvation. And it can only be attain, obtained when a person turns from their sin. It's called repentance. Turning from a life of sin unto God in faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting in Him and Him alone as your Savior. That is salvation, my friend. Michael Jackson didn't have it. The eighth reason Michael Jackson's life and death matters is it teaches us the vanity of of popularity. Jesus said, Woe unto you when all people speak well of you. Wow. That's strange, isn't it? Don't we, want every, don't we want people to say good things about us? Why would Jesus say that? He said that because mankind loves darkness more than light. In fact, strangely, man loves what God hates and he hates what God loves. Luke 21, 17 says, You'll be hated by all men for my name's sake. Jesus is talking to his disciples there. You'll be hated, he said. That's the testimony of one who truly loves Christ, one who's really owned of Christ, has a true saving relationship to Jesus Christ. They'll be hated by this world, not loved, certainly not worshipped. In John 17, 14, The world has hated them. Jesus is praying to his Father here. He says the world has hated them, speaking of his own disciples. Why? Because they're not of the world. Just as I'm not of the world, he says. Popularity in this world, my friend, is nothing more than a signature that you are of the world. And if you are of the world, you're not of Christ's. Jesus clearly taught that his people are not of this world, and as a result, they're despised and hated. In the end, in the end Michael Jackson's fame was completely vain and worthless before God. And all the attention his death has received as a result is an evidence of how much stock people put into what's of such little or no value. The ninth reason why Michael Jackson's life and death matter, it reminds us of how short life really is. James says in James 4.14, life is a vapor. It's here for a little while and then vanishes away. Just like that, it's gone. Yet, how this vapor is lived, what you do with this vapor has eternal consequences. You know, we could talk about eternity. How do, you, how, do you, how do you compare eternity to this life? You can't. I mean, if I pluck one little tiny piece of grass, that's, that's this life in light of all eternity, all these other blades of grass in the cemetery. Even, even if I compared it to this city, this, this state, the United States, it still pales in, in, in comparison because eternity's forever. It's infinite. What happens in this little speck of time that God gives us has eternal consequences. That's serious. The tenth reason why Michael Jackson's life and death matter is because in the end, he's just another man. He's just like you, he's just like me. He is. Yet we have the same, he, the same disease, the same need, and we're going to face the same judge, our Creator, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, When's your heart attack coming? When's that car accident coming to you? When's that sudden death of some sort coming? You don't know, do you? I don't know either. But are you ready to face the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Because when it happens, that's what you'll be doing. You'll be giving account to Him. I want to close with a quote from a missionary back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He said this, "'Tis only one life, only one, and soon shall pass. Oh, it passes fast. And only what's done in Christ will last.